uh, with us. I uh, hope that you'll come back anytime you're, you're available in the, in the area. We'd love to have you uh, uh, come join us for worship at any, po- any time. We're going to uh, continue in uh, our study of Joshua. We're going to finish up chapter 10 and 11 today. Um, if you uh, pay attention to the calendar, you know that we have two more classes. And if you pay attention to what I just said, you realize we're in chapter 10 and 11 of Joshua. And there are, I don't know, 24 chapters. Um, but we are on schedule. Trust me. Now, the, uh, after tonight, uh, next class, uh, we'll cover a wide swath of the book. There's uh, several chapters that um, are, uh, um, I hate to say anything in the Bible is a little tedious, but they're a little tedious. Uh, and so we'll, uh, we'll cover, cover a big uh, swath of them next week and then finish up the, uh, the week after that. So we're, uh, we're about where, where I had planned to be. Uh, all along, so uh, at least as far as you know, uh, and so um, I think we'll be we'll be in good shape. All right, everybody's here uh, and in, so we'll uh, start with a, a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful to you for this day. We're grateful for this opportunity that we have to together together and to study your word. We pray that the time that we spend here tonight will be uh, profitable to us. That we will edify and encourage one another. We will. Uh, have fellowship with one another and and draw closer to one another. But most of all, Heavenly Father, we pray that the time that we spend here tonight will be uh, glory and an honor to you and that everything will be done acceptably in your sight. There are many, Heavenly Father, in this congregation and and, and in our uh, acquaintance that uh, need your care. So many that are struggling with health issues, so many that are struggling with difficulties of life. Uh, We pray that your blessings would be upon them, that you would bring healing, that you would bring comfort, that you would bring strength wherever it is needed, and that you would help each of us to look around and to uh, lift each other up and to help in any way that we can. We're grateful for your word and for the truths that are contained in it. We pray that you would help us to uh, study it with open hearts and open minds and to gain the the truths that you uh, wish us to, to learn so that we might be better able to serve you each and every day. Please forgive us of our sins. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Uh, Last week, we we spent most of our time talking about the the ceremony and the the uh, reaffirmation of the covenant at Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. And then we ended up uh, uh, talking a little bit about the the conquest in southern Canaan. And so we want to finish that up and then uh, continue going forward from there. But we kind of hit that pretty quick last week. And so I want to... uh, to kind of go back and, and touch on that in a little more, a little more detail. You can see from the, uh, the map that we've uh, looked at any number of times, uh, we've, we've looked at this, uh, this incursion into uh, central uh, Canaan, and where we are today, uh, the beginning of class is on the, uh, the conquest in southern Canaan, and then we'll, uh, the second half of the class, we'll talk about the, uh, the conquest of the, the northern uh, part. But the, uh, the chart that we looked at last week, uh, and I, as I said, it looks a little bit like a uh, weather diagram with the hail and the sun and the snow and uh, whatever else is, is up on there. It tells a little bit about the, uh, the, the alliance that was formed that was uh, uh, brought against the children of Israel here at, uh, at Gibeon. And the alliance, uh, as we see in Joshua 10, was uh, begun or put together by the king of Jerusalem, Adonai Zedek. And he heard how Joshua had captured Ai there in verse 1, had devoted it to destruction, uh, doing to, to Ai and his king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them. And so he formed this, uh, this alliance and decided to strike Gideon. And you can see the, uh, the arrows here at the bottom, these red arrows, are the areas that, uh, where this alliance was formed from the uh, Eglon and Lachish, uh, Makeda, Jarmuth, and uh, Hebron, and then Jerusalem. And they, they came and attacked, uh, attacked Gideon. And we talked a little bit about you know, why that would be the case. Why attack Gibeon? Gibeon wasn't necessarily the enemy. Uh, but the, uh, the, uh, the things we, we talked about were maybe uh, just, uh, first of all, sheer anger uh, at sort of someone who had, had become a traitor, uh, so to speak, to, uh, to Canaan uh, or to the, uh, the rest of the, the surrounding areas. 
Uh, and so maybe that was part of it. Maybe it was to sort of entrap um, Israel and to, to entice them into a battle. Uh, maybe it was to, um, uh, to, to try to, to turn Gibeon back to the, uh, the alliance that, that they had because Gibeon was um, described as a, uh, a large city with a, a, a ro like one of the royal cities, I believe is the term that was used. But in, in all of this, we see that God uh, fought for, uh, for Israel. And so we see as we come down to uh, verse uh, uh, 6, so the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp in Gilgal, and uh, because they had, had made a pact with uh, Israel and with Joshua, they said, basically, you need to come and help us. You need to come and uh, save us from these ones who are attacking us. And so Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him in verse 7, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Joshua went with the, uh, the blessing of the Lord, do not fear them. For I have given, given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly, having marched up all night from Gilgal. And so we see that, that God uh, fought for, for Israel. And he did that in, in basically three ways. And we see in, uh, in verse 10, the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel. Now exactly how that happened, uh, we, don't, we don't know. Um, I'm sure part of it was Joshua kind of launching a surprise attack on them. You know, after having marched uh, all night, uh, the roughly 18 miles from uh, Gilgal to, uh, to Gibeon. But as they were being pursued by the Israelites towards the cities of Ezekiah and Makeda, we see that uh, as they fled before Israel, while they were going down the ascent of Beth Horon, the Lord threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Ezekiah, and they died. There were more who died because of the hailstones then the sons of Israel killed with the sword. And we kind of passed over that pretty quickly last week. But think about that. Uh, you know, we, we, we see about hailstorms um, fairly often. I mean, we had, wasn't there hail down here a month or so ago? Um, I know uh, William and Emma sent a video of some hail up at their house in, in New York uh, a few weeks ago. You know, when we think about hail, what, what do we usually think about? Yeah, just a little, little uh, uh, you know, marble size hail. Uh, what's the worst thing that hail generally does to us in Florida? Yeah, mess, mess cars up. Uh, messes uh, cars up or maybe maybe breaks the windshield. Um, you know, we occasionally you'll see pictures of, you know, uh, hail the size of like an orange. You know, the, the one hailstone that someone picks up and takes a picture of and kind of goes viral on the internet. Um, in Colorado uh, and out west, I remember uh, Dick Qualls talking about um, hail storms that would come in off the plains and, and wipe out, uh, you know, all the crops, uh, wipe out um, uh, all the, the hay. Uh, and, uh, you know, he would, I remember, I had occasion to spend several hours in a car with him on a couple of, of occasions. And uh, most of those conversations were, uh, Mr. Qualls, tell me about Colorado. And then six hours later, you know, we would be uh, where we were going. Um, and so I learned about all those things. Shannon, am I right? I'm right. I, lo I love him. Uh, but he, uh, he, he was, would tell about these hailstorms that would come in and, and wipe out the, uh, uh, the crops and, and, you know, even perhaps kill some of the, uh, the, the livestock. But I, I can't think of any time that I've read of hail killing a person. Have you? I can't. And so I'm, I'm trying to, you know, we, we kind of pass over this, but, but this was, you know, something completely out of the ordinary, obviously. Uh, and something that God chose to do for his people. But think about the size of, you know, the, the, the hailstones that had to be just pelting these uh, Canaanites as they, you know, ran from the Israelites. And not only, I mean, 
you've got a bunch of people running there. Uh, you know, God had pretty good aim, didn't he? I mean, he was hitting, hitting the Canaanites and missing the, uh, the Israelites. Uh, you know, this was, was a pretty uh, unique event. We don't, we don't really see anything like this in, um, in Joshua before or, or after this. Uh, that I that I can recall. I mean, in, jo in in Jericho, you know, the walls fell down miraculously. Um, and and I, you know, God told him how to, to set up an ambush. But as far as you know, God from heaven throwing things down, uh, raining hailstones on the uh, the enemy of the Israelites. This is pretty uh, pretty unique, and it it, it was a a, a slaughter. Uh, there were more who died because of the hailstones and the sons of Israel uh, killed with the sword. But not only in that way did God fight for, uh, for Israel, but he answered Joshua's prayer. And this is about where we ended up last week. Um, Joshua prayed uh, in verse 12 and spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. And so, you know, Joshua had the, I don't know if audacity is the right word, but the, uh, the, um, uh, the presumption maybe to, to stand in front of the people and to ask God, you know, perform this miracle, you know, perform a miracle so that we can continue to, uh, to, to gain this, this victory. And we mentioned last week that, you know, that was putting himself kind of on the line because if, uh, if that was not God's will, then uh, certainly his, uh, his leadership was going to, uh, to, take a, uh, to take a hit from this and so you can see sort of the uh, the, the uh, area that we're talking about the sun standing still at Gibeon and the uh, the moon over the valley of, uh, of Agilon and you can see a little bit better on this uh, this map that doesn't have so many of the uh, the graphics but you can see Gibeon over here you can see the uh, Agilon Valley uh, over here and so they would have been in this in this area right here well the sun when, uh, when Joshua prayed this prayer, it had to be pretty early in the day because the sun was still behind him. The sun was still to the east. And uh, so it was fairly early in the day when, uh, when Joshua uh, prayed, this, uh, prayed this prayer. And then it says in verse 13, uh, the sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There is, has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. And so there's some, some different theories and, and different uh, ideas maybe about what this, um, what this miracle uh, entailed or how God uh, performed it. We talked about that briefly, uh, whether it was a, uh, some sort of eclipse. And, and some people hold that maybe it was because uh, that would have uh, been part of what set the Canaanites into a panic. Uh, because they were very much a uh, people who, who looked at the sky and the astrology and the sun and the stars and anything that would have been uh, out of the ordinary would have, would have caused them distress. That doesn't really fit with what the scriptures say because you've got the sun back behind Joshua's army and the moon up here. So it wouldn't have, they weren't really, they were opposite the way they were looking. They weren't in line with one another. So, so an eclipse probably... Uh, probably wasn't it. Uh, I mentioned last week, and I, I, I do need to make a correction, I said the, the earth uh, could have stopped rotating, uh, but I said if that was the case, you know, God had to do something with gravity because we were all been flying off in all sorts of directions. Somebody informed me that that was not right, and so uh, I take that back. Uh, it was still been a pretty, pretty amazing miracle, uh, and I kind of like to think that we would all just fly off, but we, apparently we wouldn't. And uh, uh, so that's, uh, don't want to uh, leave the wrong impression. But whatever the case was, something, God made it in such a way that the light of the day uh, was prolonged. But there is one other alternative, and, and 
I think it may be a little uh, less likely because of the, the, the way the wording is. Some say that perhaps what Joshua was praying for, because it was early in the day, was that the, uh, the darkness continue. Uh, because he had marched all night, he had attacked early in the morning, and so maybe what his prayer was was that the uh, the the darkness or maybe the uh, uh, the the gloom of of early morning would continue so that the sun wouldn't get so hot during the day and and his his army could uh, continue to uh, to pursue them. Um, but I think the uh, the most likely explanation and the the one that fits with the uh, the text the best is however God chose to do it. Uh, God prolonged the day and gave uh, his armies, the army of Israel, uh, ample time to pursue and to defeat uh, this alliance of, uh, of five kings. But I think the, uh, the important thing to keep in, in mind is what it says in verse 14. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. And so we see as we come back... Uh, once the, uh, the pursuit was over, once the, uh, the hailstones had, had rained down on the, uh, the enemies of Israel, that Joshua came back to uh, Makeda, or Makeda, where the five kings had, had hidden in a uh, cave and executed them. Uh, and so we see in, in verse uh, 17, it was told to Joshua, the five kings have been found hidden in the cave of Makeda. And Joshua said, roll large stones against the mouth of the cave, set men by to guard them. But don't stay there, keep pursuing, and then we'll come back and take care of it. So when uh, that was done, they came back, they brought the five kings out and, and executed them. What did Joshua do uh, to these five kings before killing them? What was the symbolism that he... He put their feet on their neck. Uh, put his feet, or put the feet of the, uh, the, the, the captains of the army on the necks of these, of these kings. And to symbolize sort of the, uh, the victory that not, not only God was giving over these kings, but what he was going to, to give uh, towards all of their enemies. And so it symbolized their defeat, uh, symbolized the dominance of Israel over them. Uh, but it's interesting in verse 25, uh, what Joshua says is, do not be afraid or dismayed. Be strong and courageous, which make a good uh, class title one day. For thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. In spite of the great victory that Joshua had won, in spite of the, uh, the, the great defeat that had been inflicted on, uh, on these people, Joshua, it would have been very easy to, to kind of congratulate everyone and say, you know, this is, y'all, boy, y'all fought great today. You know, this is, this is a, a great victory. Uh, you know, our, uh, our uh, uh, strategy was uh, worked out great. But who did he give credit to? He gave credit to God. He said, God, God did this and God is going to continue to do this uh, to, all of, um, to all of our, our enemies. And then going on down in verse uh, 29 of chapter 10, we kind of see a summary of all of these uh, victories uh, in the south. And you can see in the, uh, at, in the map sort of the, the distance that, uh, that they went from Gibeon. They went down to Makeda, where the, uh, the kings were, were executed, uh, to Libna, to Lachish, to Eglon, to Hebron, to Debir, down to the uh, Negev, up to G Gaza, and then back over to, uh, to Gilgal. And so there was this whole big swath through the, uh, through the south. And we see, it, we see in, uh, uh, in each of these verses where it talks about them, uh, he devoted every person in these cities to destruction, uh, as he had done to the city before. Uh, and just one right after the other, devoted them all to, uh, to destruction. As we look, talked about a couple of weeks ago, the people were harem. They were devoted to destruction. They were given over to God. But the cities were not, were not burned. And then in verse 42, sort of the, uh, the summary of all this, that Joshua captured all of these kings and their land at one time because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned and all Israel with him uh, to the camp at Gilgal. And so that kind of, you know, in one sort of fell swoop, uh, takes care of this, uh, this whole southern part of, uh, of Israel. And this was not done in one day. It, it's, it's kind of uh, summarized there in, in just a few verses, but just the uh, getting from one point to the other would have taken uh, several days uh, travel and journey and, and march. 
And so, you know, obviously this was taken over a, a period of time. But, uh, but we can see that, that at this point, they have taken, they have split the, the, the nation in half. Uh, they have taken the southern part and now are going to, uh, to turn their attention uh, to, the, uh, to the northern part of, uh, of Canaan. And so we see that in, uh, in chapter 11. Uh, and you, you have sort of basically the same story when you look at uh, chapter 11, uh, as far as an alliance that is formed against the, uh, the Israelites. And so you've got the uh, uh, Jabin, king of uh, Hazor, uh, that formed an alliance much like um, the king of Jerusalem did. And so he, he has these uh, multiple kings and, uh, and cities that uh, uh, he brings together. And look in, in chapter 11, uh, verses 1 through uh, 5, particularly in verse uh, 4. It says, And they came out with all their troops. Well, let's go back to verse uh, uh, one. When Jabin, king of Hazor, heard of this, he sent to Jobab, king of Madon, and to the kings of Shimram, and to the king of Akshaph, and the kings who were in the northern hill country, and in the Arabah, south of Chinneroth, and in the lowland, and in Nafor Dor on the west, to the Canaanites in the east and the west, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Hivites under Hermon in the land of Mizpah. And they came out with all their troops, a great horde in number like the sand that is on the seashore with very many horses and chariots. And you got all this, this description of, you know, all these different places, uh, most of which we don't really even know where they are. Uh, and you've got this, 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 these uh, adjectives that describe him, you know, the sand on the seashore, uh, a great horde, very, uh, very many horses and chariots. Why, why did God take so much time to list all of this? You know, what was the point of, of naming all of these cities? Why not just say, you know, there was an alliance of kings, uh, save, save some space. Why did he go to, to such a great length to, to bring out all of these different places and to, to talk about all of the, uh, the number of, of people that were, were gathered together. What was his point in doing that? Yes, sir. I think that's it. I think, I think one of the things he's trying, that the Lord is trying to, to tell us here uh, and to tell Israel is you know, this, this was a, a formidable force that was arrayed against them. And you look down and, uh, uh, you know, he even brings up a great, uh, very many horses and chariots. Well, have we heard of horses and chariots before in Joshua? I don't think so. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe there were, but I, I, don't, I don't recall any. Uh, so maybe they were a northern uh, Canaanite uh, uh, war technology uh, rather than uh, something in, in southern Canaan. But he, he's, he's making a point here, I think, to, to show the, uh, the forces that, uh, that are arrayed against them. And I think the, the reason he does that uh, is to show his power, as, as Neil uh, says. You know, Hazor was a, uh, a major city. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about this more in just a few minutes. It was probably the largest in Canaan at the time. It covered about two, 200 acres. Uh, its uh, population ranged um, anywhere from 20,000 to 40,000, depending on who you, who you read. Uh, and so it was, a, uh, it was a, big, a big city. And so all of these forces against Israel were overwhelming. And you can see, or you can just kind of imagine the, the Israelites, you know, seeing this, this great, force in front of them and you know how how did they march into battle with on their feet didn't they i mean they didn't have horses they didn't have have uh beasts to uh, to carry them i know the the picture there is had to have camels it kind of looks like uh, lawrence of arabia crossing the delaware a little bit uh but i, I like i like the uh i like it it's a good uh a good picture but the um, uh, and Heather came up with that certainly not uh, I'm not creative enough to do that if it was up to me you'd have a black background and white letters and that's uh, that's about it but you know that's not really how they they fought they they were on their feet and so you know God points out that there were very many uh, horses and chariots he um, 
And so, you know, the, we see that back in, uh, in Deuteronomy 20, uh, in verse 1, that uh, Moses even told the people before uh, he, he died, says, you're going to come into the land and you're going to see uh, these things. When you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Well, that's exactly the situation that they're in now. Uh, that's exactly what God uh, had warned them about and told them about. And this is what the Lord said to Joshua in chapter 11. Uh, Do not be afraid of them. For tomorrow at this time I will give uh, over all of them to you slain. And so God is, is pointing out the, uh, the size of the foe so that he can point out the, the magnitude of his victory uh, for them. And so Joshua uh, and, and God told, tells him, when, when you do that, when you, slay them, when you have slain them all, uh, you shall hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. And so Joshua and all his warriors came at them at the waters of uh, Merim and, uh, and attacked them and struck them until he left uh, none of them uh, remaining. And then just in, in following what God had told them or to do, uh, it says he struck, he hamstrung the horses and burn their chariots with fire. Why, why did he do that? I mean, what, what would our uh, first inclination have been? I mean, if you're attacking a, uh, a foe and, and, and all of a sudden, you know, let's say in, in modern parlance, they've got tanks and you don't. And all of a sudden you, you kill everyone and all of a sudden here's all these tanks sitting there. What are you going to do with them? Yeah, you're, you're going to try to figure out how to drive them, aren't you? You're going to look around for the keys, uh, figure out how to, how to use them. And God specifically tells him, you know, hamstring the horses. Um, you know, I don't, I'm, don't know anything about horses, but apparently cutting the, uh, the, the, the hamstring uh, makes them not suitable for for military use it's not the same as killing them they could be used maybe for uh, agricultural purposes or or beasts of burden but they're no longer able to uh to pull and to uh to to pull with speed uh chariots um at least that's what i'm told but uh the uh he tells them you know do that to the horses and burn the chariots with fire why yeah because he wants to make sure they're not trusting in that. And, and that's a, a recurring theme throughout the, uh, throughout the Old Testament. We see it over in, uh, in Psalm uh, chapter 20 and verse 7. Don't, he says, don't trust in, in horses and chariots. Some are going to put their trust in these things. But he says, Where do, you trust in me. You know, and God, I think, had, had, had gone to great lengths to tell them, first of all, this is a great force that's fighting against you. And second of all, when you kill them all and, and there's all these implements of war sitting there that you can, can take, destroy them. Don't use them. Because God wanted to make sure when it was all said and done, who got credit for taking the land of Canaan? God did. Because God was fighting for Israel. And so it's, uh, I think he goes out of his way to, uh, to make sure... That they, uh, that they knew to do that. And so after this, uh, after this defeat uh, in verse uh, 10 uh, or verse 11, he struck with the sword all who were in it, devoting them to destruction. There was none left that breathed, and he, he burned uh, hot sore with, uh, with fire. This was something that was, um, was not normally uh, done. There were only three cities uh, that I think that uh, we see that, that Joshua burned. Uh, or at least that are specifically mentioned, Jericho, I, and then uh, Hotsor. You can see uh, way up, Hotsor is way up in the, uh, the far north, uh, north of the, uh, the Sea of uh, Galilee, between the Sea of Galilee and, and Lake Hula. So it is uh, very, very far north in the, uh, in the land of Canaan. But it was a, as we said, it was a, a, great, a great city. And maybe because of that, that was why uh, Joshua decided, uh, or, and God I'm sure directed him to do so, uh, to burn it, uh, because it was the ringleader of the alliance, because it was a, uh, a great city. Uh, you can see, uh, this is the, uh, the 
the tail of uh, Hotsor is much bigger than uh, some of the mounds that we've seen of, of the other cities. You know, we looked at the mound of, uh, of Ai, we looked even at the mound of uh, Jericho, and they were much smaller. This, this one covered approximately uh, 200 acres, as I said before. It was a, uh, it was a, large, a large city. Uh, the, uh, there's a couple of um, interesting, uh, uh, it's been well excavated. Uh, this is a picture from uh, Luke Chandler and his, uh, his blog uh, on, the, on the interweb, internet, excuse me, interweb, I say that facetiously and now I can't not say it. Uh, but uh, this is a, uh, the ruins of the steps going down from the, uh, there was an upper city and then a lower city. And so you can see a, uh, this is sort of the path going from the upper city, uh, the more heavily fortified area, down to the, uh, the lower path. And so you see the, uh, the stones are going down, and then there was an altar in this area. But this is all dates from the time of, uh, of Joshua. There's another uh, uh, palace uh, that has been found, a ceremonial palace. And one of the things that has been, uh, been discovered, and it, you can't really get a sense of perception or perspective from this picture, but that black line right there is uh, an ash uh, layer. And so it is a layer of, uh, of ash that has been, uh, uh, that dates back uh, to the time of, of Joshua. And so when we read that, uh, that Joshua burned the city, uh, this is very possibly uh, some of the ash from that, uh, from that event. And again, that's from uh, Luke Chandler's uh, website. So it, it's, it's, again, just sort of a, uh, uh, gives a little bit of uh, uh, realism and uh, um, perspective of what, uh, what was going on. Uh, Hotsor, we also see in Judges 4, uh, the city was rebuilt. By the time we get to Judges 4 and the story of Deborah, uh, Hotsor was the, uh, the city that was oppressing the, uh, uh, the Israelites and that, that, Jud that Deborah uh, helped them to, to overcome. Later on, we see that it was used as an administrative center by Solomon. So it's, we see it throughout the, um, throughout the, uh, the, the Old Testament. Uh, and so you come down then to verse uh, 16, verses 16 through 23, sort of a uh, summary of the, uh, the conquest. And so Joshua took all of the land, the hill country, all the Negev, all the land of Goshen, the lowland, the Arabah, the hill country of Israel, and this lowland. Uh, and then it goes on and says, Joshua made war a long time with those kings. So this was not something, again, that, that happened quickly. And we're going to see next week that it was not something that was complete either. Uh, there were some areas that were not uh, conquered and, and were not, uh, um, the people were not uh, killed. And so all of this uh, kind of came back uh, against the, uh, the Israelites in, in later days. But the conquest uh, was a, uh, a long process. But I want to look at um, chapter uh, 11, verse 20. It says, For it was the Lord's doing to harden their hearts, that they should come against Israel in battle, in order that they should be devoted to destruction and should receive no mercy, but be destroyed, just as the Lord commanded Israel. And so in the, in the time that we have left, I want to uh, talk about something we, we kind of brought up this last, uh, last week and, and have really kind of brought up uh, a couple of times before. I don't know if we'll have time to finish it tonight or not. And that is this idea of the, the, the nature of warfare and the nature of the destruction uh, that Joshua was, was inflicting upon the, uh, the Canaanites. And, you know, we see in this verse, uh, whose doing was it? It was the Lord's doing, that he hardened their hearts. Well, who else's heart was hardened by God? All right, Pharaoh. Pharaoh was the, uh, is the, the classic example of uh, someone whose heart was hardened. And, you know, when, when you study Exodus, when you think about, about those things, Pharaoh uh, made these choices and, and God hardened his heart. And he did so so that he could do what? Defeat him and show his power and his superiority uh, over him. And we come over to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, the same type of, uh, the same phrase and the same type of idea when we look at the, uh, at the Canaanites. Uh, you know, God hardened their hearts. 
uh, that they should come against Israel in battle in order that they should be devoted to destruction and should receive no mercy but be destroyed. How do we describe God? God is a God of what? Mercy. God is a God of what? Love. God is a God of grace. God is a God who hardened these people's hearts so that they all were going to be destroyed. That, that doesn't jive too well, does it? That, that seems like it's, it's, it's uh, uh, a contradiction. You know, how do, we, how do we do that? We know God does this. Uh, he did it with Pharaoh. Uh, we see in, uh, in Romans chapter 1, you know, where it talks about the, uh, the people who, who uh, the, the Gentiles who turned away from God. And, and over and over, it says God did what? Gave them up to, to follow after their, their passions. In other words, they made a choice. And God, God at, at some point, if you make that choice, God basically says, okay, that's the choice you're making. We're going to continue that to the end. And we talk about that if, uh, if you were in my idolatry class. Uh, and, and even if you were in my idolatry class, the chance of you remembering anything from that class are probably slim and none. But one of the points that we made was that, that those who worshipped idols became like those idols. And so, you know, God over and over in, in Isaiah and other passages talks about, you know, idols are, are dumb. They, they have ears, but they don't hear. And they have eyes, but they don't see. Well, what, ha what eventually happens to the people that worship them? He says, you, you have ears, but you're not hearing. You have eyes, but you're not seeing what you need to see. And so they have become like those idols that they worship. And, and I think that's all part of this idea of, of, of God kind of letting people follow their choice to its natural conclusion. And so, you know, we see that in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. In verse 12, that where God sends a strong delusion that they might believe a lie. Now, I, there's a lot in, in all of this that I don't understand, but I, I do think the teaching is clear that there comes a point in time where God says, okay, you've had your chance. You've, you've made your choice. Let's see where this ends up. And that's, that's what happened to the, uh, to the Canaanites. But it still uh, is, is perplexing to us, I think, when we, when we think about the thousands of innocent people in Canaan who were, were slaughtered. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, and then that, you know, that's the, the lesson of Rahab is, is, you know, there were so many that, that heard of these, these things uh, that, that chose not to, to obey uh, or not, chose not to act on, on what they heard. And, you know, when we see Rahab kind of put it forth as a, um, uh, an illustration of faith, that's, that's the point. Um, she, she heard and she, uh, she acted, acted on that. Well, this, this idea of... of you know, how can a, uh, a just and a loving and a merciful God instruct his, his people to, to wholesale slaughter uh, these Canaanites uh, is something that, that, you know, causes a lot of people some, uh, some issues. And, and probably, if we're, we're honest, uh, causes us uh, some issues as well. There's... Um, Certainly in, in literature and in, in writings uh, uh, over the years, there's been a lot of this that has come up. Uh, Thomas Paine, who you may remember from junior high uh, American history, uh, wrote Common Sense back in the time of the Revolution. Um, one of the things that he wrote in, in some of his writings says, God is the Mars of the Jews. That is speaking of the God of war of the, uh, the Greeks and the Romans in mythology. God is the Mars of the Jews, the fighting God of Israel, boisterous, contemptible, and vulgar. 
uh, you know, looking at things like this and, and saying, well, God is just a God of war. God is all about uh, killing and slaughtering people. In more modern times, uh, Richard Dawson is one of the most um, well-known uh, atheists uh, in, in, uh, in the world today. And in his book, The God Delusion, he speaks of God, uh, and this is just a small part of a, a very long quote, but he speaks of God as being racist, uh, infanticidal, genocidal, a capriciously malevolent bully. Uh, and again, that goes back to this, uh, to this idea that we've just been talking about. Christopher Hitchens, um, who died a couple of years ago, uh, in his book, and, uh, God is Not Great, says the Bible may, indeed does, contain a warrant for trafficking in humans, for ethnic cleansing, for slavery, for bride price, and for indiscriminate massacre. But, and this is the good thing about it as he sees it, but we are not bound by any of it because it was put together by crude, un uncultured human mammals. Uh, and so, you know, he points out that the Bible approves all of this stuff, but we don't have to do it because it was just written, written by men. And my point in bringing these, these quotes uh, up is that this, this has caused an issue and, and still continues to cause an issue uh, with a lot of people. And it is something that, that I think we uh, sometimes struggle with ourselves. Uh, you know, how does God, how do we answer someone who says, well, how does God say, go in and, and just wipe out all of these people? Uh, you know, men, women, and children. Uh, men, okay, you know, the army, uh, the, the warriors, okay. But women and children, you know, how, how, can, how can that jive with what, what we see God in the, in the New Testament? And so I just wanted to bring up some, uh, a few, uh, few points, and, and we'll see how many of these we, uh, we get to. But one of the things we need to keep in mind, and, and I'll, I'll say this at the beginning, is uh, to, to lower your expectations. When we get done, I'm not going to answer your questions. Uh, you know, you're still going to have questions. I'm still going to have questions. Uh, this is a difficult uh, subject. And, uh, you know, if, if the five minutes we spend on it, you know, we're not going to, uh, to, to, to do it justice. But we need to keep in mind that God was executing divine uh, justice with all of this. This was the result of sin. We talked about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Going all the way back to Genesis chapter 9, where, where Canaan, uh, Ham, was cursed. Uh, with uh, in regards to the sin there with no it was prophesied to uh, to Abraham uh, God told Abraham your people are going to uh, uh, stay in captivity for 400 years but they're then they'll come out but not yet because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full in other words the time was not not right for all of this to take place this was because the uh, of the sins of the uh, of the Canaanites uh, in, in Deuteronomy 18, Leviticus 18, uh, and several other passages, uh, God makes it clear to Israel, says, I'm driving these people out uh, before you because of their sins. Not because you're so great, not because of your righteousness, but because of their iniquity. That's the, uh, that's the purpose of this. Uh, and so Israel was warned about that, uh, and Israel was being used as an instrument of judgment in much the same way that Assyria and Babylon were going to eventually be used as an instrument of judgment against, uh, against Israel. Uh, Israel was warned that they would suffer the same fate if they were, uh, if they were disobedient. Uh, we'll, we'll touch on these just briefly and then uh, finish up next week. Uh, just a few things to, to Think about this was not racially motivated. This was not uh, a, a genocide in, in the way that we think about genocide today. Uh, these these people that were being killed, they were not a separate race. They were not, uh, in many cases, even a, a nation. Uh, they were uh, these sort of city states uh, in uh, in Canaan. This was not a, a, a racial, uh, ethnic uh, cleansing type situation. And we'll talk about uh, the idea in more detail next week, this type of warfare was a limited event. Uh, this was not the normal type of warfare that, uh, that was prescribed in the, uh, in the law of, uh, of Moses. And this was consistent uh, with God's judgment in other areas. Uh, you know, think about uh, before next week, some, some other uh, types of judgments that we see God uh, 
exacting on, uh, on people because of their sin. And then it shows that God, uh, shows how God judges uh, sin in the past and how he's going to do so uh, in the future. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes we lose, uh, we lose sight of that. Uh, so we'll, those are just some ideas to kind of mull over over the next week. Uh, and then we'll uh, flesh these out a little bit. Uh, first part of class uh, next Sunday. And then finish up in there. All right. Appreciate your attendance and participation tonight.